Opened in 1920, Harlem's Cotton Club was a red-hot venue. However, despite its location, the club's audience was whites only, in stark contrast to its cast of all-black performers. So what was the legendary Cotton Club really like? In 1920, the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution banned the sale, production, and transportation of alcohol in the U.S. This meant clubs were forbidden from selling alcohol to their customers, but prohibition didn't curb alcohol consumption. Organized crime took control of the bootlegging business, and moonshine and bathtub gin came to replace other, safer kinds of liquor. It may have seemed like a risky time to open a club, but when it came to drinks, it was a seller's market. So in 1920, at the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, African-American boxing champion Jack Johnson opened Club Deluxe on the first floor of a building located at 142nd Street and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. Two years later, bootlegger Oni Madden bought and expanded the place, renaming it the Cotton Club and stocking it with his, quote, number one booze. The Cotton Club was briefly closed by the police in 1925, but Madden made an arrangement and there were no more legal run-ins for the duration of Prohibition. It was owned by people who uh very influential and uh, prestigious with having things accomplished. So if you could get into the Cotton Club, you could enjoy a glass of gangster-made beer. The Cotton Club was a whites-only venue featuring African-American performers, and in an outrageous twist, the club's decor was unapologetically racist, with jungle and plantation themes decorating the walls and stage. According to Wesley Lye's essay, The Cotton Club, How Black Performers Faced and Confronted Oppression, Madden and his all-white management team exploited and mistreated the black employees. For example, Madden wouldn't let Duke Ellington quit the Cotton Club unless he paid the entire replacement orchestra out of his own pocket. I'm, I'm with the company. I just spoke with Mr. Stark. I don't care what Mr. Stark says. If you're with the company, you belong to me. Other accounts, however, portray the black performers as competent and assertive with their gangster bosses. According to musician Cab Calloway, who led the Cotton Club's orchestra for many years, the whites-only policy was far from strict. Eventually, the policy was abolished, but during its prime in Harlem, the Cotton Club did entertain a mostly white audience, even though the performers were always African American. Several jazz greats launched their careers at the Cotton Club, including Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, and Josephine Baker, just to name a few. In 1927, the Cotton Club was already the poshest, most popular venue in Harlem when they hired Ellington to lead the house band, who were called the Washingtonians. Ellington's first show was called Rhythmania, and he performed alongside Adelaide Hall, who would go on to become one of the most famous voices in American jazz. The waiters were giving odds on us getting thrown out after three or four days or something like that, and we stayed there five years. During this time, Ellington composed many of his masterpieces, including Black and Tan Fantasy, Moon Indigo, and Creole Rhapsody. By the time his Cotton Club residency ended in 1931, Ellington had become world famous. After Ellington left the Cotton Club, Cab Calloway and his band took over. During his three years at the club, Calloway wrote his famous song, Minnie the Moocher. Toward the end of Calloway's residency and the beginning of Jimmy Lunsford's, the Cotton Club enjoyed unprecedented popularity. Oni Madden was serving time for manslaughter in Sing Sing Prison when he started angling to purchase Club Deluxe from Jack Johnson. By 1923, Madden, now free, got to work transforming Club Deluxe into the Cotton Club. It was his idea to entertain a white audience and to portray the African-American performers as exotic or savage. He also increased the club's capacity from 400 to 700 and instituted weekly radio broadcasts to attract well-heeled guests to his Harlem hotspot. But Madden wasn't a businessman. He was a gangster with the nickname The Killer, and he attracted like-minded peers to his club. In his autobiography, The Big C, Langston Hughes confirmed that the club was a destination for gangsters and arguably their wives. While pictures of famous actors and musicians at the Cotton Club can still be seen today, those of Madden's friends and foes are more difficult to find. But the Cotton Club is a place where the two worlds met and mingled, including stars like Frank Sinatra, who had one foot in each. The Cotton Club's ad for dancers called for, quote, tall, tan, and terrific girls, but the reality was a bit more specific. Female dancers were required to be taller than 5'6", younger than 21, and preferably light skin. For male dancers, skin color didn't matter as much. Famous Cotton Club male dancers like Chuck Green, Bill Bojangles Robinson, and the Nicholas Brothers were hired for their tap and acrobatic dancing skills, not their physiques. Female dancers wore very revealing outfits, but that doesn't mean they didn't have impressive skills and couldn't be stars in their own right. Two examples are Bessie Dudley and Florence Hill, who often danced to Duke Ellington's fast-paced rhythms. Then there was Lena Horne, who began her dancing career at the Cotton Club and went on to become a world-renowned performer. Despite its strict hiring policies, Horn remains thankful to the club. The Cotton Club was a great place because it hired us, for one thing, at a time when it was really rough for black performers. 
The Cotton Club's house bands, most notably Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway's, were known for their fast-paced tunes and at times comedic moments, but Calloway took it up a notch with the myriad of drug references in his songs. Many of the moochers down in Chinatown, all the cookers are laying around, some are high and some are mighty low, counting millions on the floor when a knock came on the door. Many the Moocher was indeed a cautionary tale about substance abuse. Many fell in love with Smokey, who taught her to smoke opium. Sadly, the song ends with Minnie pushing up daisies. When asked if his songs reflected the everyday life in Harlem in the 1920s and 1930s, Calloway said there were quite a lot of marijuana street vendors. The guys used to walk around the street selling it, you know, just like they were uh, selling uh, peat nuts. Calloway didn't share anything about the harder drugs he hints at in his lyrics. Bill Robinson began dancing when he was eight years old as an orphan desperate to make ends meet. But by the time the Cotton Club hired him in the late 1920s, he was already a famous tap dancer, known for his ability to run backwards 75 yards in 8.2 seconds and for his unique stair dance. Cotton Club performer Adelaide Hall remembers that Robinson, who called himself Bo Jangles, was the most popular dancer on the bill. The reason was simple. Well, he was unusual. <laughs> he was very unusual. He had his moments. <laughs> But uh, he was a good soul. He really was. Facts and numbers back this up. In 1936, Robinson was earning $3,500 a week, the highest salary ever paid to a nightclub performer at the time, and by far the most money an African-American performer had made up until then. Sadly, Robinson died nearly broke thanks to an extravagant lifestyle and gambling habit. Arguably, one of the most precious Cotton Club live moments would have been the famous duet of Duke Ellington and Adelaide Hall. Paul had already headlined her first European tour in 1926, after rising to fame with Shuffle Along in Broadway. In 1927, Ellington had just taken over the Cotton Club's house band when he heard Paul singing. Paul remembered standing in the wings to hear him play, saying, There was that one tune that I loved so much. It was Creole Love Paul. I started humming a counter melody, and he came over to the side of the wing and he said, Oh, Addy, my goodness, that's just what I've been looking for. Paul and Ellington went on to record a new version of Creole Love Call together, which became a hit around the globe. Following this and several other songs the two recorded together, Ellington and Hall's Cotton Club shows became increasingly popular. Once Duke Ellington became associated with the Cotton Club, his fame grew thanks to radio airplay. His increasing popularity gave him compositional freedom. He slowly shifted away from so-called jungle style and experimented with new styles, instruments, and orchestral arrangements. Times were changing for African-American performers, but Ellington also wanted freedom for African-American patrons, so he used to stardom in good relationship with the Cotton Club's management to help relax the whites-only policy. Perhaps this is why Cap Calloway doesn't remember playing to all-white audiences. He came after Ellington and his anti-segregation efforts. In fact, in June 1935, the Cotton Club began welcoming African-American guests. The first integrated event was a gala held before a Joe Louis fight. Cotton Club Parade 1934 was one of the club's most famous musical reviews. Apart from big names like Adelaide Hall, Lena Horne, and Avon Long, the 1934 review included something never seen before. Indeed, the show featured the first ever dry ice machine used to create a fog effect on stage. The fog was only used during Hall's performance of Ill Wind, but it made waves throughout the United States. Cotton Club Parade 1934 became the club's highest grossing show to date. It lasted for six months and played to 600,000 customers, the Cotton Club's all-time record. The review came to an end at the Cotton Club in September 1934, but that wasn't the end of the show itself. Adelaide Hall and the entire Cotton Club Orchestra took the show on tour across America, perhaps with the dry ice machine in tow. The Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 1930s was a huge step forward for African-American culture and paved the way for the Civil Rights Movement. But that's not to say that all black Harlem residents had a great life. Racial inequality was still a big problem in the 1930s, especially when it came to finding and keeping a job. In March 1935, tensions reached a boiling point after 16-year-old Lino Rivera was arrested for stealing a pen knife. Rivera was free, but some 10,000 people took to the streets to protest police brutality, destroying a lot of property in the process. The Cotton Club wasn't physically affected, but when it came to racial injustice, the club was a heated debate subject. As of early 1935, racial segregation was still in place at the club. Writer and Harlem Renaissance patron Carl von Vechten seized the moment to begin pushing patrons to boycott the Cotton Club in protest of its racist policies. These threats, along with complaints from the black performers, led management to temporarily close the Cotton Club. When it reopened in 1936 on Broadway and 48th Street, the Cotton Club no longer had its whites-only policy in place. The late 1930s brought a decline in the Cotton Club's popularity and earnings, and the club closed its doors permanently in 1940 after an increase in rent and the threat of Manhattan club owners being investigated for tax evasion. 
The Great Depression and the government's gross neglect of Harlem hushed the once teeming clubs of the Harlem Renaissance. But Cotton Club fans could rest assured as several reincarnations of the club popped up in the following decades across the United States. First off, there was the Cotton Club Chicago branch. This branch was operated by Al Capone's brother Ralph. Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, and Louis Armstrong also performed at the California Cotton Club, which was based in Culver City. Cotton Club branches later opened in Lubbock, Texas in 1938, Las Vegas in 1944, and finally Portland, Oregon in 1963. While many of these branches have since closed, there's still a cotton club in New York City today, although it's neither as posh nor as popular as the original establishment. 